So here we go. So unfortunately with photography, photography is a concept that is, a lot of people think that it's just pressing a button. Well, it's a lot, it's obviously a lot more than that. So one of the biggest tricks of this is the fact that um, there's some technicals. Um, and so everybody's different about how they learn and how they absorb technical issues and information, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm going to try and make it as easily digestible as possible. But this week and next week have some time, have some technical stuff in it. So if you need to watch this again, by all means do. Um, I'll try to provide other resources for you to look at, to watch and sort of absorb. Uh, and again, as always, if you have questions, please let me know. Always, 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 please let me know. Uh, the, the email works, although it's a slow process. The text is a little faster. I'll go over those numbers again at the end of class. Okay, so we're gonna get going here. We're gonna go with our PowerPoint. Um, and I'll let you know when the important stuff is. I gotta do the screen share. The screen share is like, I can't just press a button without looking at the screen, so I gotta do this. <clears throat> so we'll do this. All right, so we're gonna talk about what's called photographic exposure. Okay, the basics of photography. So the definition of photographic exposure is exposure is the correct amount of light to require to create an image on a sensor or film. So whether we're talking about digital cameras or regular film cameras, we're talking about the correct amount of light has to come in in order to create that exposure itself, okay? <clears throat> So you have, there's a couple different controls for exposure. Number one is shutter speed. How long is the shutter open? Is it something like the picture on the left, which is the kayaker where she's falling into the water where that's a really fast shutter speed. That's a very fast um, type of shutter speed concept. I'm trying to press the button to admit. Let's see, too many buttons to hit. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> there we go. I think she got in. Okay, so shutter speed. So the one on the left is very short shutter speed, like like one one thousandth of a second or faster, because you can see the individual droplets of water. Whereas the other picture, the picture on the right, is a very long exposure. We're talking exposure that's probably ten to fifteen minutes or something. It's a picture of a, of a carnival ride, so it's a very long exposure. So shutter speed is how long. Now in this particular uh, PowerPoint, this is one in which I'm not going to go into st a stunning amount of detail in parts of it because it's sort of an overall concept as far as what we're doing okay so there's details that i'm going to leave out a little bit only because some of this is this week some of it is the next following weeks so if i go over a little faster over a few things forgive me it's it's designed for later on okay so the next one of this too many buttons to press man there we go is aperture how large is the opening that let it slide in? So in, in photography, there's the aperture, which is the opening of the camera. There's a, there's a small set of blades inside, the, inside your lens that opens and closes to different sizes and lets different amounts of lights in, light in. We'll go into this in much more detail next week, but just basically the concept of apertures, it lets let more, more or less light in, plus it also controls what we call depth of field. So aperture can do this type of thing, where on this far left picture here, we can see that the one canoe is in focus, number 155 is in focus, but the other ones are out of focus. So it sort of brings the viewer into that particular image itself. Or we can do the opposite, where we have a very small aperture, we can make the whole thing in focus, like this one here, this picture of my son Thomas when we were in Arizona, <clears throat> so everything's in focus from the rock that's in front of my feet, essentially, to the furthest power station off in the distance. Everything's in focus. So that's what aperture does. And mm, too many buttons. Man, it's, you'd think that it would just be easier to do this, to accept people into the classes. <laughs> Hang on a second. There we go. Sorry. All right. So let's see where we're here. All right. Exposure controls, aperture, how large the light was in. And again, these are details. This is stuff we're going to go into much more greater detail next week uh, as far as how to use this and do things like that. So the next thing is. ISO. This is the tricky one that is sometimes a little baffling. I'll be honest with you. It's sometimes tough to understand it uh, to work with. There's reasons we need to control it. Some reasons we don't. 
Okay, there's a sense, there's a there's a sliding scale as far as what our ISO or sensitivity is, and when we say sensitivity is the fact that we want to have different settings for different light settings we're in. So, for example, this is a sort of a, a graphic of this in the fact that when we have a really bright circumstance, like it's a really bright sunny day, like it's been the last couple of days, um, we probably want to have a lower ISO. Some cameras don't always have low numbers. Uh, some cameras, some cameras, the lowest number you might have is 200. And that's okay. That's nothing wrong with that. Uh, every, every camera is a little bit different. Um, but basically, if you're in a bright sunny condition, you probably want a lower number. If you want a lower light condition, you know, you're under candlelight or starlight or moonlight, you probably want a higher number. So sometimes people think, well, why can't I just go with the higher number all the time? Why can't I just like put it at 51,000 all the time? The problem with putting it at a very high number is that, that what happens is, is your camera has a problem with what we call, well, we call it gain. Some people call it noise or, 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 or static. There's little dots and stuff like that. The detail of the picture doesn't come out as good, the higher the number. So trying to keep it to the lower side is usually a good thing, but that's not a etched in granite kind of rule. Okay, so exposure controls. Last one is light. Is it, is it daytime? Is it low light? Is it nighttime? What's the deal? So the one on the left is, uh, is right there at Sonoma Raceway, NASCAR race. So it's a bright sunny day. How do we know it's a bright sunny day? We have all the shadows right there on the ground. Plus it's daytime. Uh, the one on the right is sort of a twilight. You know, it's getting lower in light. So it's a picture of the Palace of Fine Arts. So let's talk about the technical of exposure and how this works. Okay, so when we talk about photographic exposure, if we sort of think of it in the way of um, filling a bucket, we have to fill a bucket with water, essentially. And so we have a couple things to work on filling this bucket with water. Today's basic way to, to sort of explain this is we're going to use basically just, you know, we're going to use shutter speed and aperture. Okay, so. <clears throat> To get because our goal is we have to fill this bucket up with water. If we fill it up with too much water, that's too much exposure, and that doesn't work for our cameras. If we don't fill it up with enough water, that's not enough exposure, and that doesn't work for our cameras. Okay, so the water is light essentially. So don't worry, it makes sense. The next slide is like super obvious what we're talking about. You know, like I'm truly thinking, what is he talking about? All right, here we go. So we have to fill that bucket with water. If I gave you a hose, like a, like a fire hose, and you had to fill a one gallon bucket full of water, <clears throat> the hose would represent the aperture, how large or how small the opening of your lens is. So with a fire hose, you've got a pretty large aperture. That's a pretty big hole letting that water come through. So if, if I was standing at the spigot of what, where you turn the water on and off, and I gave you the hose, and you're going to fill a one gallon bucket up with water and I turn it on, how long is it going to be until you say, okay, turn it off? Well, most likely it's going to be pretty short amount of time. You don't have to use a stopwatch. It'd be like, okay, on off, you know, it'll be fast. It'll fat, fill up really fast. So consequently, if we have a really large aperture, an aperture that lets a lot of light in, so the aperture is, is the biggest it can possibly be, we wouldn't have our, shut, we, our shutter speed be really fast. So if we want fast shutter speeds, our apertures have to be wide open, okay? Don't worry, this clears up and makes sense as we go along, okay? <clears throat> now we're gonna do the same thing again, but instead of using fire hose, now we're gonna use those fish tank hoses. You know, the fish tank hoses you use to make the bubbles in your, your fish tank. So that's not a lot of, that, that, that aperture is pretty small. Okay, so if I went again, I went over to the spigot to turn the water on, and you put the fish tank hose, fish tank hose line in the bucket to fill it up with a gallon of water, and you said, "Okay, go." And I turn the fish the water on. How long is it going to be until the bucket is full? You know, what device would you use to time it if you were doing it with this method? Well, you'd probably use like a sundial because you'll be there quite a while. You'll be there a couple hours, probably trying to fill up a gallon. Um, you're probably trying to fill up a trying to fill up a gallon of water that way. Hang on a second. Oh, I love this thing. It's love Zoom. Zoom is the best. Sorry. All right. 
So now the water tank hose, whole bit, yeah, yeah. So we fill it up with water there, sundial. So basically, if we have a smaller aperture, you know, we're we have a smaller aperture, smaller amount of light coming through, or we're using a very small hose to put water into a bucket. It's going to take a long time to make that happen. Okay, now. Like I said, this photography stuff can be sometimes technically technically challenging, and I understand that. If you don't get it, that's okay. Okay, you only have to get one part of it for this week's assignment, and that's shutter speed. Okay, but as we go along, please feel free to ask questions at the very end of my at the end of, at the end of this uh, I almost said performance uh, at the end of this lecture. I will give you time to ask, you know ask questions and things like that. If you have something it doesn't make sense, or as you go along this week, you go to shoot the assignment you're like that doesn't work. Let me know, and I'll, I'm here to help you with that. Okay. All right. So there's this thing called reciprocity when we talk about photographic exposure, and that is that reciprocity is, is another way of saying something's equal to each other. So reciprocity means that if I have a bucket of water and I use a shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second, so a really fast shutter speed, but a wide open aperture, and it filled the bucket up, that's the exact same exposure is if I use one thirtieth of a second, a really long shutter speed at F22, a really small aperture. So those two things equal each other. Okay. So there's a concept called reciprocity. Don't worry, I'm not going to put that on a test. Uh, it's pretty easy to work, but I'm not going to put it on a test for you. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to go to bonus level for this part of it. Just a little bonus level thing because I just want to go over a few things because there's something that's kind of handy in this next bonus level. I promise I will never quiz you on the bonus level stuff. It's just information for out there. Okay. So bonus level is this term called BDE or basic daylight exposure. And so what is the basic daylight exposure? Some people also can refer to it as what's called the sunny 16 rule. So what, what are you talking about? So when I went to uh, one of my schools that I went to, the first class in, it was a, it was a teacher saying BDE this and BDE that and talking about BDE all day long. I had no idea what he's talking about. And I was a little shy. I was a little shy to raise my hand and say, I don't know what you're talking about. So, but eventually I did figure it out. So what is basic daylight exposure? Well, as it's back in the day, as they say, before, way before digital cameras, even before actual film cameras, they had to figure out what is the correct exposure because they didn't have anything that told them what to set the camera on for the exposure for what they're doing. Okay. So way back in these types of days. So they had to figure out how to do this. Well, they started to realize we can figure out what's the constant of light. Meaning that if we went outside today at noon, so another hour and a half or whatever, you went outside and measured how much light there was, wherever you are, that can be a constant. So noon anywhere should be sort of the same type of light in the fact that the idea is where is the sun the brightest? Well, sometimes people, if I ask people, well, what about if you measured it in Napa? You went to Napa and you got a device that could read light. I have these, a light meter. Hang on a second. It's right here. I have, let me get out of full screen and go to camera. You can hopefully you can see my camera mode. Anyways, so I have this little device here that can read light. So let me go back to the screen. So many buttons to press. So we're in, Na we're in Napa and I take the light meter reading. So Napa is like, like less than a hundred feet above sea level. Uh, and I'm whatever the reading it comes up. Now, if I travel across the globe and I go to Nepal and I do the same light meter reading, is it, and Nepal is like, let's say we went near the top of Everest, you know, 20 something thousand feet. Is it going to be less, more, or the same amount of light in Nepal as it is in Napa? Well, a lot of times people think, well, it's Nat Nepal because that's like higher up. You know, it's higher up and so it's closer to the sun, the bright, and the, it doesn't work that way. The reason why is because we're about 93 million miles away from that sun. And so no matter what, whether you're at 100 feet above sea level or 30,000 feet above sea level, uh, that's really not a big difference in 93 million miles. So there's really no difference. So essentially, we can take a light meter reading anywhere in the world at noon if as long as it's not cloudy and say that's a constant, we know that that's the that's sort of the, the zero point of light, so to speak, except if you're like on the on the on the uh, the, pole, the poles and stuff. 
Okay, so this be like basic back to basics, uh, basic daylight exposure. What it is is essentially you convert the ISO of your camera to the shutter speed. So like I had that scale. Um, and so you would take your ISO and change it to shutter speed. Don't worry, I'll show you what it means in a second. And I put my camera to F16. I know some of you are like, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what you're talking about. We'll slow down there. Don't worry, some of this is obvious now and some of it will become obvious as we go along. I promise I will make it really easy for you, but I can't make it super easy all the way through. There's always speed bumps. <laughs> so ISO, so take your shutter speed at ISO. So for example, if you're hiding your ISO at 100, you know, the ISO 100, you convert your shutter speed to 1 100th of a second and then put it at F16. So your shutter speed would be 1 100th of a second at F16. So all this, they, all this stuff, well, this, is, this is bonus, I'm dying here. Why would you want to know this? What is it? Why is it important to know this information? Well, it's a lot. Sometimes it's not. I mean, like I'm not at a shoot like the shoot that I have this afternoon at 12. I'm not going to be like, you know, measuring the light outside. I'm going to let my camera do it. But there's one really cool thing. This is the one of hopefully one of the coolest things you'll learn about in this class. What can you use this for? Well, here's what you can use it for. What lights the moon? The moon is not lit by its own power source or light source. The sun lights the moon. So you can take pictures of the moon with the Sunny 16 rule. So for example, if you're gonna photograph the moon on a full moon, you would set your camera to the Sunny 16 concept. Cause I'm sure a lot of us have gone out and tried to take pictures of the moon with our iPhones. And how well did that work? Probably didn't work all that well, did it? You get a white blob up in the sky. So that's why we can't really, for the most part, take pictures of the moon with our phones. But you can with your camera. And basically, you set it to the, to the M setting on the dial and set it to the sunny 16 rule. Okay? Don't worry, I'll go over this again. All right. So. Not that. Okay, so back to this. Oh, so much fun. Okay, so now let's go to the, let's go to the basics. So now we have to go into one more basic thing before I get to your assignment. Now I don't want to I don't want to to jip you from time. All right. So let's go to the what we call the, the meat the meat of this thing. Oops. Hey now, maybe if I hit share screen, that would be handy, wouldn't it? All right. Here we go. So we're going to talk about shutter speed. Okay. So there's here's a few things you probably want to write down, especially for this week's quiz. Okay. This is the write down part. And that is the first thing is shutter speed is defined as the length of time that the film or the sensor is exposed to light. Okay. That's the actual definition of what shutter speed is. So length of time that the film or sensor is exposed to light. Essentially, when my lecture concepts, if I repeat the same thing three times, Beetlejuice has nothing to do with it, but it will be on a quiz. Okay, So shutter speed is the length of time that the film or the sensor is exposed to light. Okay. It's recorded as fractions of a second to minutes to hours. Okay. In this class, we're going to do fractions of a second, maybe a second, but we're not going to do, we're not going to do minutes and hours. Uh, so you have terms like this, one five hundredth of a second, a fourth of a second, four seconds, 15 minutes, two hours. <laughs> now on your cameras, when you're looking through the viewfinder or sometimes on the screen, there's little data that, that shows on the bottom of the screen. If you see quotation marks, that's usually not a good thing. If it says 30 and then it has like a quotation mark to the right of the number 30, that's probably not the best thing you'll see. That probably means you're in a really low light situation. You might have the lens cap on, there's other things. So you wanna be looking for those two little quotation marks. So in the shutter speed concept, you have the mode dial. What should I set my mode to? So for this week's class, for the most part, you're gonna be putting your camera. If you have a Canon camera, you're gonna put the mode dial to TV which oddly enough does not stand for television, it stands for time value. So Canon is the one company that does this, everybody else does another different thing. So if you have a Canon camera, you're gonna set the mode dial to TV. So just for a second on here, uh, for the most part, most of the time I will tell you what mode to set your camera on. It's not that the other modes are bad, uh, but there's certain things we have to learn how the modes work. So for this week, you're gonna put it on TV, if you have a Canon camera. Uh, and if you have some other camera, like every other camera on the planet, 
uh, you're going to put it to the S mode. Okay. And every dial is a little bit different. Nothing is, you know, one brand isn't better than another for the most part. Uh, but for this week, you're going to either have it on S or the TV, whichever you, whatever works best, you know, whichever brand camera works for you. Okay. So let's talk about shutter speed. What happens when you set it to a long shutter speed? Well, this would be a very long shutter speed. This is the shutter speed of about an hour. So this is a picture where I've aimed my camera at the North Star and exposed it for about an hour. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at the trail of light as we turn through the universe. Um, those little dots across there are planes that are flying. This is up near Placerville. What would a short shutter speed look like? Well, this is a short shutter speed. Now, here's the tricky part that sometimes people can get stumbled on and that's okay. We need to figure out what we're talking about. We need to dissect the words sometimes. Sometimes we can use the word fast. Sometimes we can use the word short. Those two words are interchangeable. So whether you said I have a fast shutter speed or a short shutter speed, those things mean the same. Okay, so this is a fast shutter speed. We know this because the fact that we can look at that water and it's sort of suspended. You know, we can see droplets of water just flying in midair. You know, I'm not Professor X and can freeze water. I've got, it's not my gig. Uh, so water has been stopped in time because I used a very fast shutter speed. If I go to a long shutter speed, or we consider that also the word slow, now water isn't frozen. Water is like this like flowing concept. We can see the elapsement of time, okay? So slow and long is one term, fast and short is another. Those are interchangeable to each, each version. Again, let me show you what a short shutter speed does. You can see how the water trap, traps up in the air like that, just frozen, okay? Water doesn't miraculously freeze like that, okay? A long shutter speed, once again, same, same fountain, but now with a longer shutter speed, you have this flowing motion type look, okay? <clears throat> So what can, you use, what can you use this for creatively? How can you make a picture look a certain way? Well, you can do things like this. This is at the uh, Martin Luther King Memorial in San Francisco. And to me, what I like about this picture is it makes the water looks like saran wrap. It's always, I, I love that type of look, it's sort of with saran wrap. And it's not a super long exposure either. It's exposure that's maybe, you know, half a second or something like that. It's not a super, it's not like 10 minutes of exposure. It's a very short shutter speed, not, that, not super long. Easily hand-holdable to get the effect, okay? Same sort of thing here where I'm waiting in the BART station to get a train. And so they have those little uh, seating areas, those brick things where you sit on. And so the exposure is not a really, really long one. It's again, it's a you know, 30th of a second. It's not super long. And you can see, because you can see the logo on the right-hand side where it says BART over on the right-hand side, you can tell that, that that sort of tells you that's not a super long exposure. It's just the train is a blur, but the people are still holding still, okay? So what's a fast shutter? What can I do to make, make time sort of freeze? Well, if someone jumps up in the air, that you can do that. So this is a drum core that I, that I was photographing, and this young lady could jump up and, and bend her back a pinch uh, while she did it. So this is a very fast shutter speed to sort of stop that action. Okay. Now, there are some issues when you're trying to illustrate shutter speed. It doesn't happen a lot, but if I try to take a picture of an airplane, specifically a propeller-driven airplane, and I use a really fast shutter speed, this is what I would get. So the problem is, is it's a very fast shutter speed. I've stopped the blade for the most part. And how does that airplane fly? Because it's not a jet. So the propeller is frozen. So we sometimes there's certain things we can do to make that happen. So on this particular shot, I took one where I had a really fast shutter speed. I took the same picture again on the same plane, but now with a little bit longer shutter speed to get that blur effect of the blades. So you're like, oh, well, yeah, I can definitely see this is a propeller driven airplane. We do the same thing with the big planes too. B-17. Okay, so one, so bonus level shutter speed techniques, okay? And bonus level, I wouldn't say really bonus level, but there is one more shutter speed technique that you'll be using in the assignment this week. And that is what they call panning. So what's gonna happen is, is we're gonna take a picture where you move the camera. Okay, so one set of pictures is gonna be where you stop something and you sort of freeze time. 
The other one is going to be that you that you elongate time, that you're going to make that make something blurry. Don't worry, I'll give you plenty of, of, of uh, ideas for pictures. And then another one where you're going to move the camera to achieve something. So this is something where this is, again, it's in a raceway, take a picture of Indy cars and the car's going by and I'm just physically moving the camera slightly as the camera, as the car goes by. Don't worry, in the next slideshow, it's only one more left. <laughs> well, I'll talk about how to do this, what's called the panning technique. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a shutter speed guideline. I promise this next two slides are not going to be in any type of, of tests. You're welcome. Okay. Shutter speed needs to be faster than the length of the lens. So we haven't really talked about the numbers on your lenses, but we, I'll briefly talk about that today. I'll go into deeper detail as we go along. Um, but basically, essentially, if you have a really long telephoto lens, a 300 millimeter lens, you couldn't possibly hand hold that at 1 60th a second because you have a heartbeat. Just the heartbeat in your hand is going to make that move around a little bit. Okay, so longer lenses need to have faster shutter speeds, essentially. Again, this is not going to be test level stuff. Uh, if you really want to get into this, let's talk. Uh, but I don't want to take the class out with that. Some other little tricks and things we use with uh, shutter speed stuff. One is we use tripods. Um, surprisingly enough, I have to put the definition of what a tripod is. It has three legs. Shocker there. <laughs> three legs steadied almost any length of time, but they're heavy. They're hard to set up. I have to use a tripod all the time when I do my real estate stuff. It's not what I would consider fun. Uh, the one kind of fun thing that I use is what's called a monopod, which is, I have to put a definition, it's a one-legged tripod. It's basically, if you took a tripod and snapped a leg off of it and use just the one leg, that's a monopod. And it's the coolest thing. I use it all the time for sports and things like that. Plus, it's a good attitude adjustment device when needed. So like I said, use it for sports, but you can't go slower than one tenth of a second. So you can't go really, really long shutter speeds with monopods, but it helps, helps hold it steady. So some cameras have the ability to have what's called image stabilization. Okay, so some of your cameras have sometimes a switch on the lens um, that you can turn this on and off. Sometimes it's built into the camera, you can turn it on and off. That's nice. It's nothing to write home about, but it's not, I just want to tell you what it is. So there is what's called in-lens stabilization. What in-lens stabilization means is that there's some sort of device built into the lens of the camera that physically moves to compensate against your movement. So traditionally, mostly Nikon and Canon do this. A few others do, but let me show you a quick video of what it looks like. This is what it looks like when you have um, this. Come on. Bless me. Thank you. So now the video doesn't work. Oh, bloody, there it is. So over here, you can see over here. So he's going to show you that. Diff, diff, well, it could be a she. I don't know. Uh, they're going to show you the different elements. This is a cutaway lens. And as we get down here, this is the device that moves up and down, left and right, in accordance to your movement. So if you move up, it moves down. You move right, it moves left. It compensates for whatever movement you have. Um, um, in when you're trying to photograph. The minor problem with this type of stabilization though is, this is a device you have to pay for. It's a special lens. You have to usually pay a little bit additional to have this type of a lens effect happen to your camera. So it's, it's definitely joining a club, a very expensive club. There you can see the lens moving up and down. It's not just randomly, it's moving up and down in accordance to your movements, okay? which is cool, but it is an expensive club to join to say the least. So there's also what's called in-camera stabilization. And what in-camera stabilization means is that the camera itself has some sort of stabilizer. So the camera has some sort of device like most cameras have where it actually, the sensor itself physically moves up and down and left and right to sort of compensate. Uh, Olympus, Sony, and Pentax tend to use this. Although now Canon and, and uh, Nikon have started to use it. Let me show you a sample of what this looks like. They're going to, they put these two cameras together to show you what it looks like. So you can see that as he moves it right and left, this is the sensor here. This is the device that takes the picture on the camera. And as you move the camera up and down, left and right, the, the sensor itself is moving and compensating for your movements. So there's some advantages to this. One of the advantages of this is the fact that it's on every lens. So if you have in, built-in stabilization in the camera, every lens you put on that camera has stabilization. Kind of a cool trick. Then it also does some other kind of cool, fancy, trickery stuff as far as um, being able to take higher resolution images. Let's say you have a, 
uh, 20 megapixel camera. Well, these cameras have what they call a sensor shift where it can take an 80 megapixel camera because it moves the sensor around to take a picture like that. Anyhow, so that's shutter speed. All right, so now let's get to the real meat and grit of it all. Let's talk about the assignment. And like I said, I'm gonna leave time at the end of this to uh, go over questions you might have, how do you set your camera, things like that. Okay. And this is all available. I'll put this, as always, I'll put this video up on the on our club class website and my YouTube channel, as well as like on this assignment, this particular uh, PowerPoint, I'll put this up on, the, on, our, on our website as well, okay, in case you have it. And as always, I can't emphasize enough, if you have questions, please, as always, please let me know. I'm here to help you. I'm not here to just throw assignments at, at you and hope that you figure it out, okay? So shutter speed. So part of it is you're going to photograph items using various techniques to show the effects of a long shutter speed, short shutter speed, and a panic technique we can have in photography. See, this is not how I would word it. <laughs> this is how the school makes me word it. All right. So this assignment designed to show different effects of shutter speed can have on images. You're going to make a collection of six images. You can use various techniques to illustrate shutter speed. Okay, that whining noise is my dog. He, even he's bored with this. He's like, Dad, that's a lot of words. That's more words than you usually put in a slideshow. Yes, but that's what the school makes me do. I'll say, let's get to the better part. So part one of this, okay, here comes notes time. And don't worry, I'll have, I have this on a regular sheet to where you don't have to watch a video all day long. I have it on a PDF to where you can just download it. If you want to take it with you, put it on your phone and look at it while you're doing the shoot, whatever you want, I have it ready for you, okay? So the first part is produce two images that illustrate the stopping or freezing of a subject. Um, this is really, this happens. Um, not the people, don't do me wrong, don't do me wrong. It's having to hit that button all the time. Uh, produce two images that illustrate the stopping or freezing of an object with a high or short or fast shutter speed, okay? So to capture the short or high shutter speed images, you must shoot the items in bright daylight they're having motion or motion to them. Someone jumping, a water fountain, something being thrown. And if you have a regular camera, you're going to put the camera on S. If you have a Canon, you're going to put it to TV. Okay. And again, this is all in a nice, lovely PDF available for a limited time only on your school website. Uh, so this pre-focus, pre-focus, we haven't really talked a lot about this because since we're not in person, I can't show you this in person. I'll show you in a moment what I talk about when, when, I, when I say pre-focus, what I'm talking about. What, I'm, what I mean by pre-focus is you press the button halfway down. So um, it's easier to demonstrate in person, but let's go for it. Let's see, what, let's see if we can get some, to work. When we're taking pictures, pressing the button halfway down gets the camera ready to shoot. Because if you're trying to take a picture of something that's moving really fast, someone swinging a baseball bat, if you don't do anything to the camera and think, okay, I want to get that picture where the ball is hitting the bat. If you don't have the camera pressed down ahead of time, the ball is going to be in the outfield before the camera takes the picture. Because the camera has to be sort of prepped and ready to go. So pressing the button halfway down, usually what happens is most, most cameras, when you first set them up, when you press the button halfway down, the camera will make a beep tone. It'll go, dee -dee. It makes some sort of beeps and beeping sound. Plus, usually you'll have some sort of green dot that appears that shows you the camera's ready to go. So for this assignment, it's really pretty important that you make sure that that green dot is on or that it's beep toning. If you're not getting that, you might want to look at the controls of your camera. There might be a couple things. One is maybe the sound is turned off on your camera. And I can really recommend that you turn the sound back on on your camera. Number two is most cameras have a little switch that says AF and MF. And MF is not what Samuel Jackson says in every movie. Okay. AF is for autofocus and MF is for manual focus. You want autofocus. Okay. Just in case you didn't know, autofocus is where you probably want to go. Unless you said, well, you know, I already have a master's degree in photography. Okay, then you use manual focus for God's sake. But if you're not, if that's not where you are, you should probably think about autofocus. I'm not saying manual focus is bad. Okay, I am saying manual focus is bad. Just use autofocus, okay, but press the button halfway down. Okay, the idea here is that you're attempting to stop or freeze time in your image. So you're trying to stop something in time. Just like I showed you those pictures of the water droplets. I can't make water droplets just hover. 
but you can with a fast shutter speed. I can't make someone levitate, but you can with a fast shutter speed. <clears throat> Here's the important part. Your shutter speed should be one 250th of a second or faster. Okay, so if you're trying to freeze something, if you're trying to stop something in midair and you have the camera set to one thirtieth of a second, you're probably not going to be super successful. Okay, so this is one of those things where when you're looking to the viewfinder or looking at the screen, you want to make sure that number is like a, a really high number, one two fiftieth of a second or faster. Consequently, most likely, other than the first sample picture I'm going to show you in a second, you, if you just shot the pictures in bright sunny daylight, you'd be perfect. Okay. So for these particular two images where you're going to stop something, shooting pictures in a bright, sunny situation is perfect. You know, 830 in your backyard, in the shade, you may not be able to get fast shutter speeds out of that. Okay, so best bet, best bet is go out on a bright, sunny situation and take pictures. So let me show you some situations. These people don't levitate. Uh, they don't. So how do they get this? They use the fast shutter speed. Okay. So they use the fast shutter speed to make it appear as if they're frozen in midair. This is what you're trying to achieve, is trying to free something in midair. Or dogs, they don't levitate. They, you know, they, they do a lot of cool things, but levitation ain't one of them. So this is a dog, you know, very fast shutter speed, so stopped it, and it froze, it, froze the dog in midair. Okay, so what else could we freeze in midair? Well, simple things like, hey, have your brother or your sister, whom somebody, throw a ball in the air, or have them step on top of a planter box, you know, maybe a foot or two off the air, off the ground, and they jump up in the air. And as they're in the air, you take a picture because they can't levitate, but you can make it look like they're levitating with shutter speed. Okay, you probably have to take a number of pictures, but your best bet is to get somewhat close to the subject. And take pictures where they're, you're stopping the action of something. Water fountains are fantastic. It's hot outside. Go get the water hose and see what happens when you turn the water hose on and you put your thumb on it and you spray it. You know, have someone else hold it and spray it and you take pictures of that. I promise you'll get it in a heartbeat. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next step. The next part is produce two, two images that illustrate the blurring of an object with a long shutter speed. To capture long shutter speed images, you should set the camera to a longer shutter speed, like 1 30th of a second or slower, okay? But I should put an asterisk in here. Uh, you don't wanna be going multiple seconds, okay? Unless you have a tripod and you put the camera on something, you probably don't wanna go longer than 30th of a second for the most part, somewhere in that range, or seconds. Again, set your camera to S or TV on a camera. The idea here is to illustrate the concept of, a, of elapsed time. So before the previous set of pictures, we tried to stop time. Now you're trying to show an elapsement of time, okay? <laughs> Again, 30 of a second or slower. So what can you do? Well, we did, I just told you a second ago, get the water hose. Water is fantastic for long exposures. This isn't that immensely long of a shutter speed probably like 30th of a second or something like that. So you don't have to go super long. You don't have to go 10 minutes. You can go 30th of a second and get great pictures like this. <clears throat> or your dog taking his water off. Okay? I know I said last week, don't take pictures of your dog and stuff like that. I'll sort of let that, but here's, here's the thing, is that with pictures like this, especially in digital photography, we, we can just crank out images. You know, you can take 200 pictures in a second almost. That would be fantastic, but I, I would hope that you would want to expand your horizons and take varieties of pictures. But back to the subject. So longer shutter speeds would work great for a water fountain. Longer shutter speeds might be a little tough in really bright sunlight conditions. Maybe sitting around, the, if you have a campfire in the backyard, that might work. There's all sorts of different things you can use for longer shutter speeds, okay? So the third one, is produce two images that illustrate the panning or, or what we call camera movement technique. To capture panning effect, your camera should be set to a medium shutter speed of 1 60th of a second, and you're gonna move the camera with the subject. Again, the challenge here is that you wanna pre-focus and, and move the camera with the object. If you don't pre-focus, you're probably not gonna get the picture to come out right. So this is sort of like what I showed you the picture, the picture I shot of the F1 race. 
or F, whatever it was. Um, so I'm, what I did is I pre-focused the camera. And when I do this, you want to have the car directly across from you. Because if, you if, you, if you're looking at the slide, if you're where your camera is and you're taking a picture of the car on the far left, it's probably not going to come out really good because it's far away. You want to be, can the, you want to be the subject to be perpendicular. So does my mouse work here? No. Mouse no working. Anyways, um, the, you have to you have this subject right across from you, okay? And you don't have to have a super long, you don't have to turn like for 10 seconds, you just barely move the camera and this will happen. Again, here it's important to be at 1 60th of a second. So where can you go? Well, just go find a, a like a bicycle trail, find a bicycle trail uh, and you can take pictures of riding their bikes by. Uh, can you do cars? You can do cars. I'm not saying you can't do cars, but oftentimes I see sometimes people forget that you have to be sort of close. You can't be like across the street, sitting in a restaurant, taking pictures of cars moving by. You have to be close. Most stuff has to be pretty close. Okay. So like this panning technique. So this is someone riding a bicycle as they go by and I pan. Okay. This makes a person who's probably only going five miles an hour look like they're on the Tour de France. Okay. Does it have to be bicycle or car? No. What about if you have someone on a swing and you panned it with them as they swing? So think outside the box. Again, I know I told you about this really secret website last week, but I'll reiterate it just in case. Now, I don't go telling everybody about this website, but it's called Google. So Google panning techniques camera. And you'll see that people should like, and I'm not saying you need to copy that, but emulate. So, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. I wouldn't have thought I could do this type of thing. Okay. Now, uh, right in time, I have bonus level, <laughs> bonus level stuff is bonus level. Okay. But you gotta be careful. You gotta promise me to be careful with this. I know I can't physically see you because all of you meet your cameras, which is cool. Uh, but you, but you're cool. So don't mess around with this too much, but it's summertime and it's a great time of the year. So if you put your camera on the TV, if you have a Canon or S for the other brands and put it on for a really long shutter speed, like two seconds, I'll warn you, don't be the driver. Well, I mean, I guess if you have a Tesla self-driving, you can do this, but otherwise don't be the driver when you do this trick, okay? But if you do a really long shutter speed in a car at night, you can get stuff like this. So as the car is going down the street, you don't have to be driving 80 miles an hour because you can see the speedometer is only like at 35 or something like that. So you don't have to be driving like super fast, but just drive it down a road that's reasonably lit as you drive down, have it, have it be like two second exposures and see what you get. What's really cool, the best cool, and again, I should sign, have you sign a waiver, is put the car above on like, if you have a sunroof, this works great for sunroofs. Put the car just above the camera, just above the sunroof. You get this killer reflection off the hood and stuff like that. Another technique, um, again, it has to be somewhat lower light, is the zoom technique, where when you're taking the picture, you're literally zooming the lens as you're taking the picture. This is a tricky one, but you can literally zoom the lens as you're taking the picture to get this effect. Okay, this would those both of those would demonstrate camera movement, because here we're moving the camera, we're moving the optics of the camera, the car one, we're moving the camera through time. Okay, so so the so let's reiterate three sets of pictures one set one picture is going to be that you're going to try to stop time you're trying to freeze an object the second one is that you're trying to illustrate a, a, a distance of time a long elongation of time and the third one is you're trying to illustrate some sort of camera movement okay when you're shooting this assignment where sometimes people get stuck on this or have problems with this um, is that sometimes people don't always, um, they get frustrated. Hey, we all get frustrated. I got frustrated when I first started taking pictures. I'm certainly not perfect. I mess up plenty of pictures. <clears throat> but when I shoot pictures, I try something different. So on your camera, my big old camera here, I'll put it to shutter priority. So I put it to the shutter priority mode down here. Okay. I know it's a backwards S. <laughs> it's a five. <laughs> it's shutter's priority. Is try different ones. See what happens. Because what's the worst thing going to happen? Well, you probably your memory card probably has a fifteen, you know, hundred pictures to shoot on it. So try something different. See what happens. Try different things. Okay. Now we talked about the different focal lengths. We're going to briefly talk about that. I'll tell you about the zoom trick. Is that when you're taking the picture, you're going to physically move the the lens as you, you see. So you, 
you snap the picture and as, you, as you're taking the picture, you're zooming the lens in or out as you're doing that zoom trick. The other th simple thing, other little simple things, ideas you might try. See, I can't do this because I have a dog right there. He's on the ground. Dutch loves to sit there. And if I move, he's going to jump. He'd probably jump in the picture if I did this anyways. But everybody has an office chair like this probably at home, right? Or somewhere. A couple of things you can do. One is if you get it, go phone a friend, get a friend and have them push you. You can see Dutch, there's Dutch's tail. You can push him down the hallway. Push, go down the hallway with the camera open. You'll get the coolest effects. You know, like inside your house, go down, push down the hallway. The other thing is I can't really spend, it's kind of cramped room. But if you take the camera and aim the camera at yourself, because most cameras, the screen can come around and flip out. So you can do like a selfie of yourself. So you do a selfie of yourself, but you spin the, the, the chair as you're doing this. Okay, so it's really the coolest trick out there. Okay, so think outside the box. Last couple of things and I'll open up to, for questions if you have any. Is I will, I would rather see someone push the limits of trying to make something work and it not work and you still turn that in rather than someone turning in 10 pictures of a hose with your finger on it. Okay. I'd rather see someone try something, see, see if it works. Like what happens if this, try it, see what happens. If it doesn't work, turn it in anyways, because if you turn something in, whoops, you know, if you turn something in that like, I don't know if this worked, I turn it in, please learn turn it in. Because I can now use that to show people, look, this is what happens if you try this, this is how we could have solved it. Um, I'm sort of the firm believer that a lot of times we learn better by making mistakes than by doing it perfectly every time. Not everybody agrees with that, but here's my concept is probably everybody learned, knows how to ride a bicycle. I'm gonna guess that you can all ride bicycles. Did you ever not fall? At some point you probably fell, you're jumping a curb, you're doing something, you fell. Whatever you were doing to make that fall happen, you're probably like, okay, I'm not gonna do that again. Unless you're like, as, as a kid when I was growing up, you, know, like you didn't do it for the rest of the day, but the next day you're like, okay, I think I can jump it farther this time, but you learn. So oftentimes I think we can learn a lot by making those mistakes. Okay. So if you had, so there we go. Okay. So that's the lecture. Do we have any questions? You can give me the questions via chat if you want, or you can give me the questions via turn your, you know, I can, you can unmute or whatever. Um, you know, if you want to unmute and go video or whatever, do we have any questions? View here. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. Well, if you don't have any questions, that's cool. Uh, oh, what shutter speed should we do for the bonus level pictures? Probably a long exposure, like multiple seconds, like maybe one second, two seconds, three seconds. You wouldn't want to go a minute. You want to go two, three, four seconds, something like that. Uh, something like that. Um, okay, so my camera set, to, uh, and I know that was a direct message, but I don't think it's that personal, I can't tell you. Uh, back focus, um, is that the same as automatic? Probably not, um, but you know what? If you can hang out for a second, Bella, I'll, let's, talk, let's talk about it after we get done with the whole meeting and we'll do one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Any other questions? Dealer, dealer, again, if you have any questions, let me give you my phone number. I'm going to put my phone number down here to everybody. And I'm going to give you my phone number. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Right up. Because uh, I see, I don't even remember it either. I don't remember my number. Uh, it is 916 572 8, oops, 8958. So if you have questions as you're going along, you know, you're like, oh man, I don't, the camera's not working. Text me, uh, I dropped the class because I wasn't sure my camera would work. Is there anyone? Uh, yes, Adriana, uh, I did, I'm sorry. I did get your message this morning. I was, it's Father's Day yesterday. Yeah, well, let's just do it. Uh, but yes, so your answer is yes. If you can hang out just a little bit or, or I'll, I'll re-email uh, you and I'll get you another code, okay? Uh, any other questions? Okay. 
Okay, other than that, we are DONE done. So what I'm gonna do is I've, I've purposely brought, blocked out my time things so that every Monday at 10 a.m. I'll have the class and every Monday at 7 p.m. I'll have the same class. So if you're like, man, I didn't get that at all. Of course you can watch it again. I'll have it up on YouTube in a couple hours. But if not, I'll also do it at seven. Uh, shows at 10 and seven every day. Uh, so, but as always, let me reemphasize this before we get going. If you have questions, don't feel out of place by asking them of me. I want you to ask questions because I don't want to just throw you under the bus and say, you figured out. I want to help you with this. I want you to try, but if it doesn't work, then hey, let's get together. Let's figure this out. You know, whether it be texting, email, Zoom, whatever. If you think, you know, I don't, I think I need a Zoom thing. Cool. Let me know. I'll set up a Zoom. I've set up private Zooms with students all the time. So that's not a problem. That's not out of my realm of what I would be willing to do to help. Okay. So other than that, we are DONE done. And I look forward to seeing your pictures this week. I'll have a, a, a video up probably in the next two days, probably maybe Wednesday or so of the images that everybody turned in from last week. Okay. Other than that, we're done. And I appreciate your time. And I'm looking forward to seeing your pictures. And I'm going, I'm going to stop recording.